Welcome and thank you for standing by. All participants are in listen-only mode until the question-answer session of today's conference. To ask a question at that time, please press star 1. Unmute your phone and record your name. Today's conference is also being recorded. If you disagree, you may disconnect. It is now my pleasure to turn the call over to our host, Mr. Andrew Schlack. Thank you, and you may begin. Great. Thank you, Sandy. Uh, welcome, everyone. On behalf of the CDFI Fund, I'd like to welcome everyone to today's webinar training related to the fiscal year 2021 CDFI Fund Financial Assistance Program application. I'm Andrew Schlack, an Associate Program Manager on the CDFI Program and Native Initiatives team, and I'm joined by a number of colleagues today, uh, including Amber Bell, who is the Program Manager for the CDFI and Native Initiative Program, as well as Elizabeth Hoffman and Matthew Pickering, who are both senior portfolio managers on the team, and they will be leading us through today's workshop on the 21 financial assistance application. A couple of housekeeping items before we get into the heart of today's agenda, um, which again are gonna be covered by Elizabeth and Matthew. So first, a uh, reminder to everyone that all the materials that we're going to cover today can be accessed on our website. So let me just quickly navigate everyone there. So from our cdfifund.gov homepage, underneath programs and training, there's a drop down menu programs. And then what we're gonna to cover today uh, is related to the financial assistance program for both the CDFI program and native initiatives. Uh, the pages are symmetrical uh, for both of these programs, but I'll just take us through Native Initiatives, the same material uh, if will be available on the CDFI program. This becomes the landing page, and what we're going to cover today is under Step 2, how to apply. And so we'll just drill in there, and that'll take us over to the application process page. And this, again, uh, this one is for Native Initiatives. There's another one, uh, identical page almost, for the CDFI uh, program. Uh, but this goes through the application process. This is where all the resources uh, for the current funding round uh, materials are housed on the website. And it includes helpful things like all of the webinar recordings. So today is actually the third recording we had a getting started recording back on December 2nd of 2020. If you missed that, that contains relevant information for setting up your SAM.gov and your grants.gov account if you have questions about that, um, and also getting started in Amos. Uh, we also publish our handy little calendar here so that you're aware of all the upcoming deadlines that Elizabeth and Matthew will be reminding us of later. Uh, as well as links to all of the workshops. So you can see here's the Tuesday workshop. Uh, so the technical assistance program was covered on Tuesday. If you missed that and have a, uh, any interest, uh, you determine you're not eligible, for example, for financial assistance because you're not a certified CDFI uh, and you're interested in the technical assistance program, you can go back and um, access that video recording. But what I really wanna focus on uh, before introducing Elizabeth uh, who's going to get us started, is that uh, underneath the financial assistance application materials, uh, what we're going to cover today are, are really the first um, three to four documents here, which is the program NOFA. Um, again, this is the NACA program NOFA, because I'm on the NACA page, but if you were on the CDFI program page, it would be the CDFI program NOFA. The program application overview, which is a collection of slides that we're going to cover today. And then the third item being the application reviewer guidance. So I just wanted to point those out uh, before we get going. If you want to cover um, the materials and just download them today. And again, we encourage people to go back to that site. We will periodically post updates as materials need to be revised for whatever reason. So um, just maybe bookmark that page during the open application period and check back uh, as guidance materials can be updated. So let me go now back to the uh, slideshow here and get us in the right view. And as I do that, 
I just want to remind folks of a couple of things that uh, we will not be covering today just to manage expectations. So uh, setting the expectation that uh, we're not going to talk about past uh, funding round decisions or prior awards. We're uh, also not going to address in detail how to enter any data within the Awards Management and Information System, or AMIS. We're not going to delve into any specific questions about matching funds, uh, which is appropriate for core FA applicants only. And we are also not going to address uh, questions related to the uh, recently announced, uh, as of today, the CDFI Rapid Response Program uh, that NOFA came out today. Um, and there's a whole series of webinars which we can talk about at the end of this call if you're uh, interested in tuning into that. But today, we really want to use the limited time we have, which again uh, is about a 45-minute presentation, uh, which will be followed by questions and answers. We really want to leave this laser focused on the financial assistance program. And so with that, uh, a, a brief look at today's agenda as I introduce Elizabeth Hoffman, who will kick us off. Elizabeth. Great. Thank you so much, Andrew. So here's our agenda for today. We'll begin with a brief overview of the CDFI fund, as well as the 2021 CDFI and NACA program. Our mission at the CDFI fund is to expand economic opportunity for underserved people and communities by supporting the growth and capacity of a national network of community development lenders, investors, and financial service providers. Our vision is an America in which all people and communities have access to the investment capital and financial services they need to prosper. We accomplish our mission through a variety of programs that support CDFIs and CDEs. Today, we'll be focusing on the CDFI program, a Native American CDFI assistance or NACA program's financial assistance program. And within our work here on the CDFI and NACA team, uh, we have twofold purpose to promote the economic revitalization and community reinvestment, me, development through investments and in and assistance to CDFIs. That's the FA portion we'll be focusing on. Uh, as well as our TA focus is to build the capacity of community-based lending organizations. The types of organizations that um, can become CD certified CDFIs uh, are these financial institution types, loan funds, credit unions, banks or depository institution holding companies, and venture capital funds. Looking at this year's uh, NOFAs, Notice of Funds Availabilities, that were published in the Federal Register, uh, it's the same certification categories we had as last year, certified CDFIs, uh, emerging CDFIs, and sponsoring entities, which is applicable only to the NACA program. And a certified CDFI is an entity that the CDFI fund has officially notified meets all the CDFI certification requirements. Uh, so only certified CDFIs uh, are eligible to apply for the FA Financial Assistance Program, and you had to be certified this year by the date of February 18th. Within the Financial Assistance Program, there's the Base Financial Assistance Program, which we'll be spending a lot of time on today, uh, as well as three supplementary programs that an organization can apply for related to persistent poverty counties financial assistance, Disability Funds Financial Assistance, and the Healthy Food Financing Initiative Financial Assistance Supplements. So the financial assistance and these supplements you can apply for if you are a certified CDFI. If you are a certified CDFI that meets what we call our SICA criteria, the small and emerging certified CDFI groups, uh, you would also be able to apply for technical assistance. With that, I will turn it over now to my colleague, Matthew Pickering, who will take us through the FA program in a bit more detail. Great. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Um, before I get started on this, I just want to uh, take a moment to say that everything we're going over today in this presentation is information that is contained within the NOFA. 
Uh, and the NOFA can be found on the website that you just saw Andrew navigate to on cdfifund.gov. Uh, so don't worry if you miss anything. Uh, the entire contents of this presentation, as well as the NOFA, are both online on that page. Uh, and so with that said, we're about to head into a, a portion of the presentation today where there are many slides with a lot of information on them. Uh, and so we're going to try to concentrate today on uh, the information that is uh, maybe different from last year or that is, you know, very critical towards um, understanding the funding program. Uh, if we do skip over uh, a thing or two now and then, it, it would be because that is something that is uh, substantially the same as it was in prior funding rounds. Uh, okay, so with that said, uh, we're going to start off with the CDFI program financial assistance. Uh, in order to be eligible, as, uh, as Elizabeth had said, you must be a certified CDFI. Uh, and very specifically, uh, that means that you must have achieved certification by the date of the uh, applicable NOFA, which in this case is February 18th. Uh, so you must be certified by February 18th, 2021. Uh, Matching funds this year, uh, core FA applicants have to submit matching funds at the time of application. Uh, the matching funds requirement, as it was last year for small and emerging CDFI, SICA groups, as well as, um, uh, yeah, sorry, SICA groups was waived in, the, uh, in this year's appropriations as well. So SICA does not have to submit matching funds. Uh, and new this year, due to the passage of the Indian Community Economic Enhancement Act of 2020, uh, what we call Native American CDFIs or Native CDFIs are also not required to submit matching funds uh, for base FA uh, in, under the CDFI program NOFA or the NACA program NOFA. And we define Native American or Native CDFI as one that primarily serves a Native community. Uh, which means that more than 50% of an organization's activities are directed towards a Native community. So uh, award amounts for the CDFI program, uh, we have Category 1, which is the SICA, Small and Emerging Groups. The maximum award request amount is going to be $700,000 for that group, and the minimum is $125,000. For Category 2 core groups, our maximum request is a million dollars, and the minimum request is 500,000, uh, or 30 percent of your portfolio outstanding if that number is less than 1,666,7. Uh, we estimate that the average FY21 award size for CDFI financial assistance for core groups would be around 589,000, and for SICA around 300,000. So awards that require matching funds, and again, that's going to be core groups that are not considered Native American CDFI, those awards uh, will be uh, based on the type of matching funds provided. Uh, so they can be in the form of loans, grants, equity investments, or deposits and credit union shares. If an award does not require matching funds, it will be in the form of a grant. Uh, we have no major changes towards the eligible activities or eligible lines of business. Uh, those are the same categories that were uh, around in previous funding rounds. The reporting period for base FA is still three years, uh, as specified in the assistance agreement. Uh, limitations on awards. Uh, you may apply for either financial assistance or technical assistance under the CDFI program, but you may not apply for both awards. Uh, and we have, uh, as in prior years, the uh, CDFI fund is prohibited from obligating more than $500 or five, excuse me, $5 million in CDFI and NACA program awards, which excludes DFFA and HFFIFA, uh, in the aggregate to any organization and its subsidiaries and affiliates during a three-year period. Uh, so for this year, we're going to be considering fiscal years 19, 20, and 21 uh, when we're talking about that $5 million funding cap. So for the NACA program financial assistance, 
uh, we're going to switch gears a little bit here. To be eligible, you must still be a certified CDFI. And again, that certification must have been achieved by the date uh, of the applicable LOFA. Uh, and for the NACA program, in addition to that, the applicant must demonstrate that at least half of their past activities were in one or more Native communities. Uh, and there will be a component where the applicant must describe how it will target lending and investing activities to a Native community. Uh, the certification target market for a NACA applicant uh, must have uh, one of several characteristics. It must be an investment area that's also uh, a geographic area of federally designated reservations, Hawaiian homelands, Alaska Native villages, or U.S. Census Bureau designated tribal statistical areas, uh, or an other targeted population of Native Americans or American Indians, uh, which includes Alaska Natives living in Alaska and Native Hawaiians living in Hawaii. Uh, as I said before, uh, matching funds new this year, uh, the Indian Community and Econ Economic Enhancement Act of 2020 has permanently waived matching funds requirements for Native American CDFIs. Uh, as a result of that, uh, all Native American CDFI applicants and hence all NACA applicants are not required to provide matching funds. For the NACA program, our maximum award request amount is a million dollars and the minimum is $150,000. We estimate this year's average award size under the NACA program to be $517,000. And again, since there are no matching funds required, all NACA base FA awards will be in the form of a grant. So NACA program eligible activities and eligible lines of business are also the same as in prior funding rounds. Uh, so we're not going to go over each one of those. The reporting period is still three years as specified in each recipient's assistance agreement. There are a couple of additional limitations on awards for NACA program recipients. Uh, you may apply for either FA or TA under the NACA program, but not for both. Uh, as a NACA applicant, you can also submit applications under both NACA and CDFI programs, uh, but you will only receive one award. If you apply under and are selected for an FA award in both the NACA program and the CDFI program, uh, you will be provided the FA award under the CDFI program. Uh, again, we have the same rule with the $5 million funding cap, which will be calculated using award funds received during FY 2019, 2020, and 2021 funding rounds. Now we're going to go into the supplemental applications, and we're going to start with Persistent Poverty Counties Financial Assistance, PPCFA. Uh, to be eligible for PPCFA, you have to be a certified CDFI that submit a base FA application. You're going to see that for all of the supplementals. In order to qualify for any of these uh, supplemental award programs, you will have to submit a base FA application. Uh, awards that require matching funds will be limited to no more than twice the amount of in-hand or committed matching funds provided at the time of application. Uh, we're going to talk a lot more about matching funds later in, the uh, in this presentation today, but um, CICA, P CICA PPCFA applicants as well as Native American CDFIs are not required to submit matching funds. For PPCFA, our maximum request amount is $300,000 and the minimum award is $100,000. We estimate this year's average PPC award to be $175,000. Uh, PPC FA awards that require matching funds will be in the form will be provided in the form of the matching funds that the applicant provides. Uh, so they can be in the form of loans, grants, equity investments, or deposits and credit union shares. If your PPC FA award does not require matching funds, uh, you the award will be made in the fund, uh, in the form of a grant. Eligible activities for PPCFA awards are, again, the same as in prior funding rounds. And that also applies to the eligible lines of business. The reporting period, also the same as in prior funding rounds, is three years. 
Uh, again, that's specified in the recipient's assistance agreement. And the limitations on awards here is that in order to receive a PPCFA award, an applicant must be selected to receive a base FA award. Uh, the PPCFA awards also count towards this $5 million funding cap that we've talked about already, which is uh, fiscal years 19, 20, and 21. The next supplemental application that we're going to talk about is Disability Funds Financial Assistance, or DFFA. In order to be eligible for DFFA, you must be a certified CDFI and have submitted a base FA application. <clears throat> Matching funds uh, rules are the same as in other uh, supplemental, pro as the same as in the PPC program. Uh, the award will be limited to no more than twice the amount of in-hand or committed matching funds provided at the time of application. Uh, SICA, DFFA applicants, and DFFA applicants qualifying as Native American CDFIs are not required to submit matching funds for DFFA. Award amounts can be as high as $500,000. The minimum award request amount is $100,000 and we estimate the average this year at 187,000. DFFA awards that require matching funds are based on the form of the matching funds provided, and those awards not requiring matching funds will be made in the form of a grant. Uh, eligible activities are the same as in prior funding rounds, as are the eligible lines of business. Reporting periods for DSSA are three years, and the only limitation on awards here is that an applicant must receive a base FA award and be selected uh, in order to receive a DSSA award. Again, DSSA awards do not count towards that five-year funding maximum. So the final supplemental application that we're gonna talk about is the Healthy Food Financing Initiative financial assistance, which is HFFI-FA. To be eligible for HFFI-FA, you must be a certified CDFI and submit a base FA application. There is no matching funds requirement for HFFI-FA. It was waived by Congress, so anyone applying for HFFI-FA this year will not be required to submit matching funds. The maximum HFFI FA award amount is $5 million, and the minimum is $500,000. We estimate this year's average award to be $1.6 million. HFFI awards are all in the form of a grant this year, and eligible activities and eligible lines of business are all the same as in prior funding rounds for HFFI FA. Reporting period is three years. Uh, specified in the recipient's assistance agreement. And again, because HFFIFA does not apply to the to $5 million three-year funding cap, the only limitation that we have here is that you must receive a base FA award in order to receive an HFFIFA award. Now we're going to take a, a couple of very brief moments here to go over the steps of uh, preparing your application and just go over some key dates. So we frame the application process here uh, as three distinct phases for financial assistance, pre-application, application components, and then submission and review. Uh, we've already had a webinar uh, a while back about the pre-application phase, which Andrew spoke about earlier, um, and now we're going to cover the, the later phases today. So applicants should make sure that they review all of the application materials on the step two page that Andrew navigated us to earlier. Uh, that material will be added to on a rolling basis, uh, so keep checking to make sure you're using the most up-to-date information. So here uh, we're going to talk about the key deadlines, which are also found uh, several times in the NOFA and on this uh, the page that Andrew helped us navigate to earlier. You'll notice that there are uh, there's a very uh, there are two big stages here in the, the deadlines for applicants. Our first big deadline is March 22nd, 2021, at 11:59 p.m. 
Uh, at that moment, there are four distinct things that all FA applicants need to consider uh, and have done if, if applicable. So by that time, all applicants must create an AMIS account, must enter their EIN and DUNS numbers in AMIS, uh, and must submit their SF-424s in grants.gov and have that SF-424 accepted in grants.gov. Uh, and must also, if you are a CETA eligible applicant, uh, but you would like to request more than that $700,000 maximum award amount, uh, by March 22nd, you'll have to submit a service request in AMIS uh, stating your intent or your desire to apply for more than $700,000. Uh, that is a new, a new element this year, so any CETA eligible groups wishing to apply for more than $700,000, uh, take note. So April 29th, 2021 will be the last day to contact CDFI and NACO program staff with any program-related questions. And on May 3rd at 5 p.m. is the last time to contact AMIS IT Help Desk regarding any technical problems. And finally, that night, May 3rd at 11.59 p.m., that is the last moment to submit your CDFI or NACO program FA or TA application uh, whatever it is that you are applying for. And now I'm going to hand it back to Elizabeth to talk a little bit more about the, the meat and potatoes of the application. Great. Thanks, Matthew. So as Matthew indicated, the SF-424 will be submitted through grants.gov, but everything else for your application will be coming in uh, through our CDFI fund AMOS system. The next couple of slides go over the AMOS components. Um, you can see the column on the right indicates what applicant types it applies to. Most of the items on this slide do apply to all our FA applicants, including the funding application detail, the narrative responses, we'll go over those sections more later, uh, the application financial data, that's seven years total, three historic fiscal years, the current fiscal year, and three projected fiscal years. You can figure out um, for the purposes of this application what your current fiscal year is in the FA application guidance, Table 13. Uh, also the FA objectives, which we'll be spending some more time on. And then for our FA core applicants uh, that are not native CDFIs, matching funds will also be an AMOS component. If you decide to apply for any of the three supplemental programs, the PPC FA, the Disabilities Funds, or the Healthy Food Financing, uh, each of those have components as well, a funding application detail, narratives, and charts with an AMIS. There are also items that you will attach uh, within the AMIS application. The resumes for your key staff, uh, either as a PDF or Word document, your organizational charts. We will ask for uh, audit and financial statements for the three most recent historic fiscal years for our unregulated applicants, so our loan funds or venture capitals, uh, and also for unregulated applicants, we will ask for a management letter from your most recent historical fiscal year, which is detailed more in Table 10 of the NOFA. Uh, we do know that not all auditors provide a management letter, so if you need to submit what we're, the statement in lieu of the management letter, which would be your own assessment of your internal controls, uh, there is a template within the AMOS application this year that will walk you through uh, exactly what, you, what you, kind of information you need to provide. For our unregulated applicants, we will also ask for your current year-to-date uh, on unaudited financial statements. And then um, FA applicants can choose to apply as a community partnership. There's some more information on this in the guidance, and if that applies uh, to how you'd like to apply, there is a community partnership agreement that you must attach. This next section of attachments um, is applicable to our FA core non-native applicants. There are a variety of types of matching funds, as Matthew um, talked a little bit about and we'll be hearing more about. If you are uh, using retained earnings as a matching fund source, there is a specific Microsoft Excel workbook calculator available on our website that you'll need to attach. Those regulated institutions using uh, retained earnings calculators will also need to attach their call reports. And if your um, matching funds include either equity investments or deposits, then documentation of those are required at the time of application. 
So now let's step back and look a little bit more broadly at the base FA application. The narrative responses are going to be in the following seven sections. Executive summary, business strategy, products and services impacts, market and competitive analysis, management and track record, financial position, and growth and projections. Please note that your FA awards, including any supplementals, can only be used for eligible activities. Those vary a bit by institution type, as shown on here, but broadly the five are financial products, financial services, loan loss reserves, development services, and capital reserves. Uh, no change in this from last year. And note that uh, your activities must occur in an eligible market or your approved target market. This slide contains the eligible lines of business that you can expend the award in, which is also contained in the NOFA and the guidance. And please note that with the exception of our depository institution holding company applicants uh, that are going to carry out their awards through their subsidiaries, awards cannot be um, passed through, transferred, or co-awarded to other third-party entities, including affiliates, subsidiaries, or others without prior written consent. Okay, so a key part of the base application, um, base FA application is selecting an FA objective, and that is broadly uh, what you, your organization is going to, you know, aim to, to do with your FA award. There are seven uh, possible FA objectives, which we will go into a little bit more detail on in a minute. And as you're selecting um, that objective and doing your projections, Please keep in mind that you can select more than one, but that does not make you more competitive. Uh, it is perfectly fine, and the majority of our applicants select just one FA objective. Uh, if you do select one, well, you have to select one, but if you select more than one, all of them will be included uh, as performance goals and measures, or PG&Ms, that you'll need to make, meet in your assistance agreement. And the PG&Ms uh, will reflect the same projected activity levels in your application. The CDFI fund will not automatically conduct a pro rata reduction if your organization does not receive your full base FA request. I know the fine print's a little small there, but the, it's in the materials on the website. Basically what that means is if you request a million dollar base FA award uh, and you're going, you project you're going to do, you know, so much, um, 50 million is, is the uh, example here in financial products closed. Over three years, that will be your benchmark, regardless of if you get the full million or if you only get 500,000. So we encourage organizations to make sure they're being realistic in their projections uh, and, and understanding that there will not be pro rata reductions if your award amount is less than your award request. A couple other things to note about your FA objectives. Uh, this is all for on balance sheet activity. Since off-balance sheet activity can't be used to meet the PG&Ms, you should not put off-balance sheet activity in your financial projections. Uh, and the second bullet here highlights that for all of the FA objectives except the seventh one, um, all these activities must be in your eligible market, it, pardon me, in an eligible market and or your approved target market. The next four slides have um, quite a bit of detail on the FA objectives, so I'm not going to, uh, you know, read you every line, but the first sort of group objectives here is 1-1 and 1-2, which are increasing the volume of financial products, or if you're a regulated institution, you could also choose to increase the volume of financial services. There are details here and in the materials on the website regarding what your PG&Ms will be, uh, what to do if you've had awards with these in the past few years. There's a great um, appendix F. And the FA guidance shows if you have a past award from 2019 or 2020 that already includes uh, FA objective 1-1 of increasing volume, how you could go about thinking about what you'd be required to do for, for an upcoming FY21 award. Uh, so those are, you know, some popular FA objectives that there's more material on in the guidance. FA objective 1-3 is to serve a new geographic area. And that's defined as an area that counts for 5% or less of your outstanding portfolio over the most recent fiscal years.
The next category of FA objectives is 1-4, 1-5, and 1-6, which respectively are new financial products, new financial services, or new development services. Uh, again, there's sort of this 5% uh, threshold. Um, you know, for example, it would count as a new financial product if it constituted 5% or less than your outstanding portfolio for the most recent year. Uh, and there's some information as well. Similarly, if you've, you know, had a recent award uh, with a new financial product as your pt and for example, you cannot choose the same one for an FY2021 application. The last FA objective, 1-7, is to serve a new targeted population. This would be, um, you know, a, a, a group that your, your agency is not yet serving. And the pt for this objective will involve uh, submitting a service request to, through AMOS to modify your approved target market to include this new targeted population. In the next few slides, we'll take a little bit to go through each of the supplementals in a little bit more detail. Uh, all three supplementals are evaluated independently from the base FA application and do not affect the amount. PPCFA, so these requests are not scored. Uh, this is based on if you are working in persistent poverty counties, uh, you can apply for this. Pretty much that's the requirement. And there's a, you know, a narrative about how you serve those counties, but um, this is awarded based on the total number of eligible applicants, funding availability, uh, your portfolio size track record. Uh, this, is, this is a pretty basic supplemental. Awards of uh, awardees of PPCFA will be required to close 100% of that amount uh, in award or equivalent funds by the end of the three-year performance with interim goals. The disability funds uh, also are a supplement to the base FA that is evaluated independently. Uh, the application is within AMIS, will be completed at the same time as the base FA. And successful applicants uh, are those that will demonstrate that they are increasing or expanding products to address the challenges of individuals with disabilities, uh, specifically in areas around asset development, affordable, accessible, or safe housing, employment opportunities, and access to assistive products and services that support health and community living. For the purposes of our DFFA program, a person with a disability is one who has a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities, or a person with a history or perceived as such, as defined by the American with Disabilities Act. And if you are a successful DFFA recipient, uh, you will be required to close an amount um, equal to or greater than 85% of your total DFFA award. Likewise, HFFI is a supplement that will be in evaluated independently with that application available in AMIS and due at the same time at the base FA application. And these awards uh, support financing activities supporting healthy food retail and non-retail outlets uh, where the majority of that loan or investment would be devoted to offering a range of healthy food choices. Some examples could include supporting an existing retail store or wholesale operation uh, to upgrade or offer an expanded range of healthy food choices or support, supporting a nonprofit organization uh, that expands the availability of healthy foods in underserved areas. The definitions uh, for healthy foods and healthy food retail outlet are included in the NOFA and drawn from USDA. And successful uh, groups will have two PGNMs, one stating that uh, they must close 100% of the total assistance provided over the course of the three-year period of performance, and also that of the total award amount, 75% must be closed to healthy food retail outlets located in food deserts. With that, I'm going to turn it back over to Matthew. All right, thank you, Elizabeth. So now we're going to dive into some of the details of uh, matching funds and supplemental application information. Uh, so matching funds are required for all core 
FA applicants, uh, with the exception of Native American CDFIs, at the time of application. Now, that applies to your base FA, PPCFA, and DFFA applications. Uh, for those who require matching funds, their FA award will match the type of matching funds provided. Uh, so what that means is if you provide matching funds that are in the form of a grant, your award will then also be in the form of a grant. Please note that applicants need to provide evidence that at least 50% of the requested award amount uh, that they've requested is either in hand or committed at the time of application submission. So the matching funds window for the FY21 funding round is January 1st, 2019 to January 15th, 2022. And what that means is that in order to qualify as an eligible source of matching funds, uh, your matching funds must have been received by your organization between these two dates. Anything received prior to January 1st, 19, or after January 15th, 2022, would not be an eligible source of matching funds uh, for this year's funding round. Now, if a matching fund source is received between January 1st, 2019, so the opening of the matching funds window, uh, and the application deadline, the CDFI fund will be considering that source as in hand at the time of application. So if a matching funds source is received after the application deadline, but prior to the end of the matching funds window, that source will be considered committed at the time of application submission. If you're, if you're selected to receive an award, uh, that recipients that require matching funds have to provide evidence that 100% of the award amount that they've received uh, in, the, in the form of matching funds are in hand before the CDFI fund will make any payments. Uh, if less than 100% of your award amount is in hand in, the form, in matching funds at the time of application, uh, we'll give you a little bit of extra time to submit evidence of in hand matching funds. You'll have until January 31st, 2022 to submit that extra uh, evidence of in-hand matching funds in order to get your award payments started. So the matching funds requirement for SICA FA, HFFI FA, uh, was waived for this year's funding round. Uh, and matching funds requirement, as I had said earlier, was permanently waived for Native American CDFIs who apply through either CDFI or NACA program. Uh, because of the Indian Community Economic Enhancement Act of 2020. So SICA FA, HFFI FA, and Native CDFI applicants are not required to submit matching funds for any award. Uh, and as always, matching funds are not required for CDFI or NACA TA applicants. Uh, we accept a variety of different types of, uh, of matching funds. Uh, including grants, loans, retained earnings, in-kind contributions, equity investments, deposits, and secondary capital. Uh, all matching funds that you submit must be non-federal sources. Uh, and you can refer to Table 9 in the CDFI program NOFA, uh, and also refer to the Fiscal Year 21 Matching Funds Guidance, which is on our website, uh, for details, uh, more details on eligible and ineligible sources of matching funds. So if you submit matching funds in the form of a loan, uh, we need you to verify that the loan has a term of three years or more. Uh, you can also use other sources uh, as, a, uh, as a loan, which includes lines of credit and loan renewals uh, that happen within the matching fund window. If you're, accepted, if you're selected to receive an award uh, and you have matching funds uh, as a loan, you'll receive your award in the form of a loan. Uh, and in the amount of the loans that you submitted as matching funds. Uh, and those, that loan will have the terms in accordance with our standardized loan product, which I'll go over with everybody in just a minute. The CDFI is not going to permit anyone to change their form of award if their award has been issued in the form of a loan. Uh, so unfortunately, if you have submitted your matching funds in the form of a loan uh, and you would like to change that after the fact, uh, that will not be possible. So uh, a loan matching funds in the form of a loan, the award will be in the form of a loan. 
So here's an overview of our standard loan product terms. Uh, this is uh, largely similar to standard loan product of prior years. Again, the, uh, the one thing that has changed here, you'll note, is that uh, due to the interest rate changes over the past year, our standard loan product interest rate is lower at 0.66% fixed. Uh, these loans have a 13-year term uh, with principal payments due in years 11 and 13 and semi-annual interest payments. You can use retained earnings uh, as a matching fund source as well, and indeed, we do get a lot of people using retained earnings. Uh, these sources, retained earnings as a source of matching funds will be considered uh, to be matched in the form of a grant. So if, an app is, if you're using retained earnings as matching funds, you'll be specifying that in your application, and you'll need to fill out a, uh, a unique calculator, which you can download on our website uh, based on your institution type. Uh, and that will be used to determine the amount of retained earnings that you have available to be used as matching funds for our programs this year. So this calculator uh, will adjust your financial statements or call reports for any revenue and expenses derived uh, from federal sources and previously used as matching funds. Uh, the CDFI fund will review all retained earnings calculators, ensuring that all of your figures match those reported in the, auto, in the audited financial statement. Um, and here's a, these two last bullet points are, are important to note as well. So retained earnings are calculated, if retained earnings are calculated using unaudited financial statements for the current year, those, uh, those retained earnings will be considered as a committed source of matching funds. We'll only, mark, uh, we'll only mark retained earnings as in-hand source of matching funds once they're confirmed by audited financial statements or call reports. The CDFI fund does not require applicants uh, to provide documentation of matching funds uh, at the time of application when the matching funds are in the form of loans and grants. Uh, which also includes in-kind contributions. However, if you're submitting retained earnings, shares, deposits, equity investments, or secondary capital as your matching fund source, uh, you will be required to provide extra documentation at the time of application. All matching fund eligibility requirements uh, are detailed in the CDFI and NACA program NOFAs, uh, and the fiscal year 2021 matching funds guidance guidance, which is on our website. CDFI core FA applicants, with the exception of Native American CDFIs, who apply for base FA, PPCFA, and DFFA, must complete the matching fund section in the FA application in Amos. Uh, you won't be able to submit your application unless you have uh, filled this out and satisfied the requirements for matching funds. For applicants that are submitting their matching funds in the form of grants, in-kind contributions, loans, shares, deposits, equity investments, and secondary capital, that matching funds information will all be incorporated into the matching fund section of the FA application. Uh, those submitting matching funds in the form of retained earnings are required to submit that completed retained earnings calculator Excel workbook uh, as an attachment to their application. And if you, uh, if you say that you're going to submit retained earnings, Amos will require you to submit that, uh, that application as an attachment. Each source of matching funds that you submit to the CDFI fund um, must contain some uh, specific pieces of information, including the provider's name, uh, whether that source is in hand or committed, the form of the matching fund, the contact name and some additional information, the amount of the, uh, of the matching fund source, the date of receipt, and an associated act eligible act FA activity. You'll also be asked to make several attestations for each matching fund source, including that that source is non-federal or that it has lost its federal character. Uh, and that appropriate documentation of the matching fund source that meet our requirements 
uh, can be provided upon request. If your matching fund source is in the form of a loan, you'll also need to attest that the loan term is three years or greater. So documentation of matching funds is not submitted at the time of application for loans and grants, uh, but acceptable documentation of all matching funds uh, used for an award must be available upon request. Uh, so refer to the, uh, the CDFI and NACA program NOFAs in the matching fund gui funds guidance for what it means to be an acceptable form of matching funds documentation. Uh, this is important to note, though, because the CDFI fund reserves the right to audit fiscal year 2021 FA recipients matching funds documentation uh, to ensure compliance with our uh, program eligibility rules. So if you're called upon to submit any information, uh, please make sure you are aware of what that information needs to be uh, and keep it on hand. And since we just went over a lot of very technical information about matching funds, uh, we're going to take a break here and do a, a very quick quiz. So, Elizabeth, are you ready to, to take this review on matching funds with me? Oh, yes. I love pop quizzes. Excellent. So, true or false? Applicants are required to enter matching funds information directly into AMIS. That would be true. Correct. So applicants will have to enter information into the matching funds section of the application in AMIS. Uh, in addition to that, some other types of matching funds are going to require additional documentation as well. The true or false, core FA applicants that do not qualify as Native American CDFIs must provide evidence of requested award amount in in-hand or committed matching funds at the time of submission. Let's see, 50%. Yes, that's also true. Correct. Yes, all applicants need to have at least 50% of the amount they requested for all awards requiring matching funds reported in their application as either committed or in-hand in matching funds when they click that submission button. True or false? Core SA applicants that do not qualify as Native American CDFIs must submit documentation such as grant agreement or proof of payment for grant and loan sources at the time of application submission. Oh, now this is tricky because some forms do need uh, documentation at submission, but I'm going to go with false because I don't think grants and loans are among those forms. Uh, you are very, very right, Elizabeth. Thank you. Uh, and that is a difficult one. The uh, Some sources of matching funds are required. Some forms of matching funds uh, do need documentation to be submitted, uh, but grant agreements and proof of payment are not one of them. Uh, however, we do, uh, we do want you to make sure that you have those documents on hand uh, in case you are, in case the CDFI fund requests to see um, documentation of your matching funds. So true or false, last question. Retained earnings must be calculated using the CDFI funds institution type specific calculator. I'm going to go with true and note that when you're uploading that calendar, it is your responsibility as the applicant to make sure that you are picking that Excel file and not a picture of your cat or some other file instead. <laughs> Very true, yes. Uh, you do need to submit the retained earnings calculator uh, that fits your institution type when you submit your application if you are using retained earnings. Uh, okay, so Elizabeth, uh, we'll hand it back to you now to wrap things up. Great, thanks everyone. I know this is a long, dense presentation, so thanks for sticking with us. Uh, again, the slides are all available on the web. In this last section, we are going to talk a bit about the evaluation process as well as uh, reminders and deadlines. So remember, there are two uh, big deadlines. The first one is March 22nd, 11.59 uh, p.m. That is when your AMOS account must be created, um, your EIN and DUNS numbers must be entered in that AMOS account, your SF-424 must be submitted via grants.gov, and if you're a SEGA group that wishes to apply for more than $700,000, that is to apply as if you were a core group, 
uh, you must submit a service request in AMOS requesting that by this March 22nd deadline. The second big deadline then is for all uh, the program application materials to be submitted within AMOS on or before May 3rd, 2021 at 11.59 p.m. Now we're going to talk about briefly about the base FA uh, application evaluation process. There is a whole evaluation process document on the website that lays out the five steps. Uh, the first is the excuse me, eligibility review, uh, where we ensure that each applicant meets the NOFA criteria. Step two is a financial analysis and compliance risk evaluation. For the compliance risk evaluation, we use an application assessment tool that uses uh, answers reported by your organization in your application about some compliance questions, uh, as well as if you've received prior awards, some of your reporting history, and that comes out with a score of one through five, um, with one being like the highest or best score. Uh, applicants scoring one, two, or three on the compliance risk evaluation automatically move on. An applicant that scores a four or a five will be further evaluated by CDFI fund staff. A similar tool, the financial assessment tool, is used for our unregulated institutions with a score of one through five that produces something very similar to the CAMELS scores, which are used for, for regulated institutions. Uh, again, that must have a rating of a three to pass on. Uh, with no significant material concerns from the regulator. Uh, just to note, based on scoring from the last three rounds, more than 99% of all applicants uh, pass this step and move on to step three. Step three is the business plan review. This is conducted by two external community development finance experts. They will be overseen by CDFI fund staff. Uh, the intent is to ensure that your business plan is comprehensive, sound and achievable. At, from step three here to step four uh, is where most of the cuts occur. Per the NOFA, this happens on a percentile um, or a, a percentage portion. The top 60% of core applicants move on from step three, and the top 70% of SICA and the top 70% of NACA FA. This slide shows the eight questions in the following five categories that the business plan reviewers use when they evaluate applications. Again, these are in the evaluation process document online. Which takes us to step four, the policy objective review. We conduct that uh, here with ourselves, with the CDFI fund staff, and we're looking at the three uh, key issues in the, author in the authorizing statute, the extent of economic distress, uh, the extent that your proposed activities will expand economic opportunities, and the extent uh, that this will result in community collaboration. There's also a due diligence review performed during step four. Uh, some applicants will not be recommended for an award based upon this. This slide shows the specific questions that we at the CDFI Fund use in our policy objectives review. Again, these are in the evaluation process document on the FA website if you want to take a little more look at them in detail. And then our final step is the award amount determination. Uh, that is also done by CDFI Fund staff, and it looks at your policy objective review score, funding availability, deployment track record, and other programmatic and risk factors. For our core FA applicants, the award is capped at 30% of your total portfolio outstanding. For SICA, it's capped at either 75% of the total portfolio outstanding or the minimum of $125,000. And for NACA, it's capped at 100% of the applicant's portfolio outstanding. We're going to speak just a little bit about the evaluation for the three supplementals now. Uh, the PPCFA request, again, if your application makes it to step four, uh, if your base FA application makes it to step four, then your PPC will be evaluated. Uh, these requests are not scored per se, but the award amounts are determined based on funding availability, uh, the requested amounts, your historic track record of deployment, pipeline, PPC projects, factors like that. 
eDisability Funds applications, if your base FA application makes it to step four, are evaluated, and these are scored on a three-point scale, uh, one to three, with one being the highest score. And the award amounts are determined based on the requests and other factors, including the deployment record, minimum award size, and funding availability. Likewise, the Healthy Food Financing Supplementals, if you apply for this program, it will be evaluated separately if your base FA application makes it to step four of that process. And this is a score, this one's scored on a point system, and then the points are grouped. And the award sizes here will be determined, uh, again, by minimum and maximum award size, the request, and factors such as your deployment track record and pipeline of healthy food projects. Before we get to our final reminders, a uh, couple notes on the award payments. When you are requesting an award with an AMIS, you also put in an initial payment amount request, and that is the amount that you expect to expend in the first 12 months after the award announcement. If you are applying for the supplementals, you will enter an initial payment amount for each of those separately. And if you uh, are an applicant that requires matching funds, Initial payments uh, will also take into account your, your matching funds that are eligible. These initial payment amounts are important because they become one of your PG&Ms if you're successful in your assistance agreement. Uh, specifically, you will be required to spend 90% of that initial payment amount within the first 12 months of the period of performance. And then uh, the second half of PG&M 5-1 is spending uh, the equivalent of 100% of your entire award by the end of the period of performance. Also note that you will not receive an initial payment until you have all your matching funds in hand if that's applicable, and you have to state this amount in AMOS or you will not be allowed to submit your application. We wanted to show the slide with the deadline for more time as a reminder. There's this cluster of, group of deadlines happening around March 22nd. Uh, including this new one for our SICA eligible FA applicants who wish to apply for FA awards greater than 700,000, essentially sort of applying as a core. You must submit a service request via AMOS by that March 22nd deadline. There is a slightly different application that gets launched in AMOS for core versus SICA, and it's based off of, you know, the eligibility. So if you would like to apply in the other category, you need to let us know. And then the dates here are listed about the last day to contact uh, us for questions about the application, contact for IT help, and the final application submission is May 3rd, 2021 at 11.59 p.m. Eastern. This slide shows some different uh, contact information. Please note, if you have questions for either at the CDFI NACA program team uh, or CCME, our Certification Compliance Monitoring and Evaluation Team, or about AMOS technical support, the fastest way to get your question answered is to log into your AMOS account and submit a service request. Uh, this just allows us to, you can easily tag which business unit you are having your question for, and you tag a program category, and it gets routed quickly, and the service request is really the preferred way to ask a question. You can also email one of these email addresses here, uh, and note that grants.gov and SAM.gov, which we didn't speak about in detail today because those were in the pre-application webinar, but the CDFI fund does not run those websites. So if you have questions about SAM.gov or grants.gov, you need to contact them directly, and we've provided that information on the screen. Here as well are the links again for both the CDFI fund, uh, CDFI program site and the NACA program site, which contain all the materials and applications, uh, pardon me, application materials may be added on a rolling basis. So that concludes our presentation for today. And uh, Andrew, maybe you could navigate us one more time to those resources on the CDSI Fund webpage real quick before we take questions and answers for anyone who might have missed it at the beginning of the webinar. Great, terrific. So, Sandy, uh, you can start teeing people up for asking questions, and I'll just pause while you do that, and then I'll navigate to the website. So, Sandy, if you want to come on in and let folks know how they can answer questions. Okay. Um, thank you. If you'd like to ask a question over the phone, please press star 1 
unmute your phone and record your name. Again, that is star one to ask a question. If you need to withdraw it, it's star two. One moment while we wait for any questions to come in. Andrew, go ahead. Great. Appreciate that, Sandy, and wonderful job, uh, Matthew and Elizabeth. That was a lot of content, so uh, we're standing by to answer any questions that folks might have. But as callers may have joined us a little late, uh, just navigating to where all these resources are on the website. Again, if uh, you go to the cdfifund.gov homepage underneath the ribbon here, programs and training programs, and we have uh, both our um, CDFI program and our native initiatives. I showed how to get there with native initiatives, native initiatives initially. So I'll just go into the CDFI program. And this is the landing page for all of the CDFI program resources. And down at the bottom, what we've covered today and what will be of interest to you as you're applying for the funding that's available that Matthew and Elizabeth talked about, um, materials are under step two, apply. And as you drill in there, uh, you can see here, as uh, we shared earlier, the pre-application webinar is posted already. So this is on the grants.gov and sam.gov and AMIS uh, systems that you'll need to register on, uh, as well as the funding round schedule. And then all of the webinars, you can see that there's two more webinars upcoming for FA and PA, uh, but the recordings will be available here underneath the access link. And then lastly, as we shared, the materials for the financial assistance uh, program are available here, including uh, obviously the NOFA and all the materials that were covered today, but also uh, as Matthew and Elizabeth have talked about uh, information on matching funds, all the supplemental programs, as well as the retained earnings calculator. Um, and uh, the last thing to point out here is the AMOS uh, training manual. So as people are filling out the application, all of these documents are, are great resources to have on hand. And also just a friendly reminder to check back there periodically as they are subject to change um, and be updated. And we will put the date that the new material is updated. So you'll know, you know if we need to uh, provide a revision this would say, you know, February 25th if we had a new frequently asked question. So these are all great resources. And at that point, I'll just put up the slide again. Uh, we're laser focused on the financial assistance program today. And so we'd ask any callers to limit their questions to this program. And Sandy, uh, do we have any questions? Yes, you do. The first question comes from Lori Glass. You may go ahead. Uh, thank you. For purposes of uh, calculating your net asset ratio, uh, if you have uh, equity-like debt that is on your balance sheet but it's, it's qualified or categorized as debt, uh, is there a way that that can be considered as equity in uh, calculating the NAR? Uh, why don't I take this question and uh, the answer is, we, you know, all the financial data inputs that we're collecting, we need them tied to audited financial statements. So it's really the presentation of the auditor. Um, we want to, you know, rely on uh, audits or call reports to confirm the data that's put in there. So if there is any mismatch between the way that you have, um, that your auditor might present the data that you want to explain, you know, a nuance that this is, you know, equity type debt, it's highly concessionary, you know, its terms are, you know, whatever the parameters are, like it's long-term debt, highly concessionary, you know, that, that sort of highly subordinated, any, any information like that can be explained in the narrative. But again, the, the data that's collected in the application financial data inputs needs to match your audit and that's what our staff will be um, comparing it against. Okay, great. Um, and then uh, closed loans, are closed loans for like multiple advanced loans, is it the amount outstanding or is it the amount of the commitment at closing? Um, so there are multiple data points within the application financial data, and 
to answer a specific question like this, um, I'll want to follow up with you or our team would want to follow up with you with a service request just so that okay. we're sure that we're confirming uh, the right information. But I think just for the uh, interest of all callers on this particular call, uh, why don't I just open up, there's this application financial data inputs workbook. And okay. if we open this up and we can just show everyone, this is a resource that we post online. Uh, again, this is not submitted as part of the application, but it's used to help you prepare your application financial data. There are both, um, you know, income statement, balance sheet, and loan portfolio data points. If you have a specific question about what's included in one of those uh, data points that is not, you know, described in the guidance, again, there's a, a, a guidance document that will define all of the terms on this sheet and what it's measuring. Um, but to answer your specific question, if it's about your uh, on-balance sheet loan portfolio closed, that is that would be closed during the, the the period. So it would be the fiscal year, and so it would be you know last year's loans closed. It would not you would not have to net out the amount that's been repaid. But again, we'd want to answer questions okay. like specifically for your organization or any other organization through a service request. But I'm glad you asked the question because it gave us Thank an opportunity you. to showcase this tool. And make a point Thank you sure. very much. I appreciate of the course. answer. The next question comes from Sanjay. I'm not going to attempt to say your last name. I apologize. You may go ahead. Ma'am, you may. Sanjay, you may be on mute. We're not hearing We're Sanjay. Not hearing. Sanjay, was that you? Check your mute button. Hi, are you referring to me? My name is Shanti. Yes. Oh, I'm so sorry. No, <laughs> that's fine. I could barely understand. So that's all right. So go right ahead. Okay, just a real quick question. Um, can you explain eligible market? Um, we understand what our, our approved target market is, but what is generally the eligible market? Um, so this is Amber. Um, I am the program manager, and so it's a pleasure to talk to everybody on the call. So the eligible market is um, really a concept that we use um, based on our statutory approval. So the CDFI, um, CDFI program statute says that we can have these approved target markets of an investment area that meets certain criteria or um, a targeted population. And so when you apply for um, certification, you pick one of these. So you say, oh, well, I'm going to serve low-income census tracts in um, Charleston, for example. Or you could say, I am going to serve African Americans um, in the state of um, Missouri. So, right, that's like the general target market, so you know what you're talking about. Well, the, the eligible market concept is basically um, just take that and take off the borders. So an eligible market is any investment area that is low income, census tract, um, or has a high poverty or high unemployment. And then any um, low income person anywhere or any Af um, African American, Native American, Hispanic, Alaska Native. Um, so it's just taking all of the OTPs or other targeted populations and the IAs and saying, that is that is eligible. So, you know, let's take it down a notch to a real example. Um, say, for example, you have a um, target market of um, Native Americans in um, South Dakota, but you also, um, somebody, a Native American in um, North Dakota um, would like you lend to them. That is an eligible market concept, but it's not part of your target market. And so, if they get, um, if they, if you get awarded, you could count that loan to 
the, the Native American in North Dakota um, as part of meeting your FA objectives. Is that more clear? Are you able to hear me? Yeah. Oh, cool. Thank you. So, yes, um, so basically, if the target market, market is low income, then the eligible market um, would that still have to be low income or could it be a native? No, it's anyone. An eligible market is anybody. Um, as long as they meet the criteria that they live in a low income um, census tract, like an investment area, approved investment area, or that the geographic boundaries are taken off. So you have to, you have to maintain certification. You have to lend 60% of your activities to your approved target market, right? But to count towards meeting your objectives in the CDFI, and NACA program, say for example, you choose um, PGNM 1-1, which is increased volume, any loan you make to an eligible market, to someone who is low income, for example, regardless of the geographic boundaries of your target market, counts. I understand. Okay, thank you. So, so it is, it would really be the criteria of the the approved target market, but you're removing the geographic boundary. You cut out for a second. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I said I understand. So it would be your approved target market, but you're removing the geographic boundaries. And if your approved target market was only investment areas, I'm also adding in the other targeted populations. Okay. Thank you very much. You bet. Our next question, it comes from Vicki Stein. You may go ahead. C can you hear me? I'm not sure I'm properly unmuted. Yeah, hey, Vicki. We can hear you. Sounds good. Oh, great. Good, good. Okay. Um, hey, folks. Um, thank you so much. Hi, Amber. Um, just uh, sort of a, I'm going to parse what might be a detail, but just to be absolutely clear, one of the uh, objectives is to serve a new targeted population. and as part of that requirement, I heard repeatedly throughout the presentation that you, we would have to uh, submit a service request to expand our existing target markets to include a new target market or target markets. Just to be absolutely clear, does, are, you really, are you really requesting that we submit a target market modification application or simply a service request which says, you know, we'd like to expand our target markets to include a new targeted population or population. So just to be absolutely clear on that, can somebody address that? Yeah, this is Amber. Um, you need to get an approval from CD, um, the CDFI fund that you have expanded your target market. So that means filing a target market modification application. The modification, simply. correct. Yeah, you so, must get, so, so, submit that that's and a get link approval. application. Right, that's a lengthy application. Okay, that's helpful. It so it's not just a service request. No. And, and just to clarify, that's over the performance of the award. That's not concurrent with applying for an FA award. Absolutely. I, I noted that, dis that distinction that in the past you had to have that certification request in and pending at the fund by a date prior to the deadline for the submission of the FA award, and now you're saying over the period of, I believe, I haven't read it carefully, but it's like two years or three years, uh, an organization would have to make a target market application submitted to the fund as part of the, if they are, if they are awarded an award as part of the compliance requirements. I'm assuming that's a yes, thank you. Thanks. The next question comes from Al Veenstrang. You may go ahead. Hi. Um, so I have a question about how we do projections in the FA application and how we include RRP, since I understand from the RRP NOFA that the RRP funds are excluded from our your FA performance. So here's my question. So I am a loan fund. 
I'm expecting to do $10 million of volume in 2022. I am requesting $2 million. I expect my RRP award to be $2 million. A million will fall under 21, a million will fall under 22. So then when I'm doing my FA application, do I put in that I'm expecting to do $10 million of loan volume in 22 or 11? Um, so we're we're in the process of updating our frequently asked questions given oops my phone alarm here forgive me uh, and so uh, we're in the process of updating the document I pulled up here is the frequently asked questions this uh, response detail will appear in both the RRP specific frequently asked questions and I think we're going to cross reference it and include it in the FA this version too. Um, I'm going to I'm going to suggest that maybe we pause on this unless a teammate wants to go into some level of detail. But the 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 answer is a little bit um, easier to sort of look at the response that has been developed and we're waiting to post it. Okay. Um, so I might put a, suggest we put a pin in this. And if there's a question once these are released and and frankly I think they're up. Somebody on my team can correct me if I'm wrong. They are up at the CDFI RRP website uh, currently, um, and I can direct you there. I'm just waiting for confirmation. Yes, they are. So so. That's, that's Amber. Um, this is Amber, just to help out. Um, yes, there. Um, this we will exactly like Andrew said. We'll update this since the RRP was announced today. Um, however, you can go, and there's a whole section around considerations for CDFI and NACA um, assistance. Um, and the interaction with RRP. So more to come, but there is um, some, some nice guidance, um, at, at least for FAQs that will help you for now until we publish that. Awesome, thank you. Yep, and I'm, I'm just, I, I pulled up the RRP website, um, so it's cdfifund.gov forward slash RRP, and those facts uh, where the response occurs is uh, item number seven, yep. and we're going to post those on the FA side uh, in short order. Thank you. Of course. The next question comes from Emily Powell. You may go ahead. Hi, thank you. Uh, my question is about the guidance about on balance sheet loans. Um, so I see the guidance says, uh, loans that an applicant may have originated but then sold or participated out are not to be counted in the total on balance sheet loans. So that makes perfect sense to me when answering the question about your portfolio. Is that same guidance to be applied when an applicant is entering their um, new originations for each year? Uh, you're specifically Correct. asking about the projected. Yeah, we we care about your capital at risk mm -hmm. as a as an indicator of your impact, if you will. And so the capital that you're putting at risk um, is what we're we're you know calibrating there. So you would include okay. the same measure in projected period. Okay. And so when yeah. they're when applicants are putting in their past performance as well if they made loans that they held on, you know, their balance sheet for a couple of weeks or a month, but they were on balance sheet when they originated them, you don't want them to include those in the originations number? No, they should Correct. include so, those because, oh, sorry, sorry. Well, so those numbers will come from your audit for historic mm -hmm. periods. And so it's at a, you know, it's the as of date of the audit, which we talk about uh, in the, application guidance so for you know balance sheet loan portfolio items you know let's just say it's a 1231 it would be the you know portfolio as of the same uh, time period so it would be you know the 1231 number so even if you you know originated 100 percent of the loan in September and then you participated it out and your you know capital at risk by 1231 was only 25 percent of that loan that would be the number that would tie to that, like, on-balance sheet loan guarantee. 
Yeah, I, I'm, I follow that for when you're reporting on your portfolio balance. I'm, I'm a little confused when it comes to um, whether or not you should report loans as when you're asking, like, you know, what have you originated, um, which I, I think is a past year number, if I'm remembering correctly, but certainly a projection. Um, so this is Amber. Um, let me just help you. Is it that okay. you clearly what you what Andrew said was absolutely correct for the balance sheet point in time? But um, when you we are trying to tie this to your what you report in the TLR. So if you close a loan um, on your balance sheet, hold it for a week, and then sell it, then you would report that in the TLR, the transaction level report, and that it would also be reported in um, the loans closed um, okay. as like the cumulative or the income statement-esque, right, um, mm -hmm. equivalent for loans. So the answer is yes. Okay. And that is that same guidance true when people are making their projections? If for the pro yes, the because it's, it's, a, it's parallel. We'll be, we will yeah. use, we use the TLR, the transaction level report, to help populate the PPR, the performance progress report, right? which mm -hmm. shows your PG and M's. And yep. so what okay. you put into your projections is what we use for your PG and M's. Got it, okay. Thank you. Yeah, so I like to think of it as that through line, right? What you mm -hmm. put in the past is equal to what you put in the future is equal to what your PG and M's are and what, um, what, what is in your assistance agreement and what yeah. you report. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Thank you. Currently, there are no additional questions. If you'd like to ask a question, please press star 1, unmute your phone, and record your name. Once again, that is star 1, unmute your phone, and record your name. We'll wait until to see if any additional questions come in. Our next question comes from Mark Edelman. You may go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, uh, my entity is uh, 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 eligible to be a, a SICA, uh, and we've also received since the last audit uh, a, a significant uh, potential match amount. And so I'm kind of wondering about the the odds uh, or the pluses and minuses applying under a, a, a core application versus a, a SICA application. And I guess the thing that jumped out at me was the 75% of outstanding uh, portfolio award determination for SICA versus 30% of the, the uh, core two uh, outstanding portfolio. Are there other considerations there? I mean, should those who are eligible SECA organizations simply go ahead and think about applying for SECA without uh, uh, re doing the required match uh, kinds of things that they don't have to do? That's a great question. Thank you. This is Elizabeth. I can take that. Um, yes, so the SECA uh, pool is there, you know, for our small and emerging CDFI group. It is uh, a less competitive pool. 70% of our SICA applicants make it between step three and step four, whereas only 60% of the core do. Uh, you are quite right that for SICA, you do not have to provide matching funds, so that is another uh, benefit for our smaller groups. And I think it's important to note um, there are other portfolio size restrictions that you mentioned, but for SICA, uh, you can apply up to 700,000, and for core, you can apply up to one million. So if you're, you know, it is a little bit more money, but you have to weigh that uh, against the other factors, such as providing match and being in the more competitive pool. Is that helpful? Yeah. Uh, can you, as a SICA, can you also apply for the supplementals that you outlined, like a uh, healthy food financing initiative? Yes, absolutely. Both SICA and CORE can apply for all three supplementals of persistent poverty, the disability funds, and the healthy food financing. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Our next question comes from Julie Gould. You may go ahead. Hi. Um, my question is um, uh, to ask whether or not you're going to have any AMOS training um, during the application period. 
You know, Good from question. time to time you. you have we don't famous, have this. Um, oh, pardon, webinars. go ahead. Sure, so I understand you're asking about AMOS training. Uh, we don't have a specific training scheduled, but there is the SA AMOS training manual on the website. It's probably over 200 pages. It has screenshots of just about everything you could ever need to do in AMOS. Uh, and of course, if you have any technical issues entering you know, any part of it or you know, part of the website seems to be malfunctioning for you, please go ahead and submit a service request. We'd be happy to help with that. Right, right. Well, that's why I thought a webinar might might boil it down to the basics for those new, you know, uh, CDFIs. Julie, uh, this is Andrew. Thanks for the question, um, too. In, in the past, we've done a lot more because the Amos application used to be, uh, what can I say, but uh, obtuse, if you will. Uh, we worked very hard over the last couple of years to make it a lot more intuitive. Um, like all the validations, it's, it's almost self-explanatory. And I think we found, we did do a sort of Amos demo in 2019. And because things sort of change in Amos dynamically, it has a very limited shelf life. So again, we're here every step of the way as staff to support you and everyone in their success in using Amos. We've just found that the application at this point since 2019 it's gone to almost like a turbo tax or a tax act, not to put in a plug for any tax preparation software, but it's a lot like that, almost that like the application itself guides uh, all applicants through the process. It's only showing you sections uh, and content that are applicable for your organization. And, you know, to those ends, it, it almost is a risk of being too confusing if we try and do anything outside of you know, just publishing the Amos guidance. But we appreciate your question. And again, our staff and the IT help desk are standing by to help address any, you know, hurdles that you might encounter. But last year, I think our service requests, you know, were so far down with like actual Amos issues that um, in the interest of time and, you know, coordination, uh, we're not going to be producing any additional um, Amos training. All right. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Of course. Our next question comes from Terry Hubblestead. Hello, can you hear me? Yep, a yes. little bit. Okay. Uh, we are newly recertified uh, as a CDFI. Uh, I do not believe we are SICA. Our notification did not say that we were, but I just wanted to double check what constitutes SICA? Thank you. Sure, great question. This is Elizabeth. So the provisions are spelled out in the NOFA, um, but SICA eligibility is twofold. One is if you um, your financing start activity state. Oh, I'm getting quite a bit of feedback. I don't think it's on. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay, great. Sorry. Um, Indeed. So the the uh, the one um, piece of SICA, the emerging piece, has to do with your start activities uh, financing date, if that's been within the last few years. The exact date is in the NOFA. And then the other is related to your total asset size as of your most recently completed historic year. So for our unregulated institutions, the asset size cutoff for SICA is $5 million. Uh, for our credit unions, I believe it's $100 million. And for banks and bank holding companies, it's $250 million. Thank you, ma'am. I did read that, and I just wanted to confirm. Thank you. You're welcome. This time, there are no additional questions. If you'd like to ask a question, please press star 1, unmute your phone, and record your name. Once again, that is star 1, unmute your phone, and record your name. One moment, please. Our next question comes from Brittany Mitchell. You may go ahead. Uh, I just have a question about the percentage that you can apply for, where you can find and how we can calculate the percentage. And then I also have a question, does the percentage include the award and the secondary piece of if you do a secondary capital loan or something like that? Uh, 
Hi, this is Elizabeth. I can answer the first part of your question. Um, so the, the size restrictions about how much you can apply for are based on your total portfolio outstanding as of your most recent fiscal year. So that, again, will be an amount coming from your audit. And the way Amos works is you'll first put in your request. Um, it's, it might seem a little backwards, but you go ahead and put in what your request amount is, and then you go complete your financial data. Once you've done that, you go back to your request page, and it'll pop up um, for you the percentage of the maximum you can amount. So if you, uh, you know, had a miscalculation, Amos will sort of help you catch that and help you adjust your award size down to, uh, to what your maximum request can be. Could you ask the second part of your question about secondary capital again? I didn't quite catch that. Yes, if we're, if we're using the award to um, boost our capital and then we have to have the secondary capital loan, you know, in hand, would that be part of the percentage or will that help when, my, when I enter everything in Amos, will that tell me pretty much then that I've done something wrong? <laughs> yeah, so this is Amber. I just want to clarify exactly what Elizabeth said is we're looking backwards on um, your on, on the maximum request is looking backwards on your most recently completed fiscal year and audit. And so um, what I think you're talking about is the matching funds required and going forward. And, you know, clearly there would be an intervention and your balance sheet could go up. And that would reflect in next year's um, application. Okay. And so it is a it's it's already past the point in time um, in which um, you um, we will have that number for the total total um, balance sheet um, total assets of the uh, last fiscal year. Sorry, I just got a little bit tongue tied. But the point is, but the point is is that um, that number is fixed and it's in your audit and it's already passed. Okay. Thank you very much. Our next question comes from Nancy Karen. You may go ahead. Hello. Um, I'm asking about PPP lending as it's dramatically impacted our portfolio this year and it assets the whole range of activities that have impact our portfolio from PPP. We don't anticipate that continuing. Um, so how are you, um, by policy or practice looking at that in terms of future projections? That's a great question, thanks. We certainly understand that, uh, you know, many of our CDFIs have been working extensively with the, with the Paycheck Protection, pardon me, Paycheck Protection Program. Uh, in our FAQs uh, on the CDFI and NAFA page, there is a whole section about Paycheck Protection should just stop trying about PPP loans, uh, and it has some questions both about uh, projections as well as looking back how you count things. So uh, I would suggest you check out those FAQs, and if you have a more specific question to your organization afterwards, please do feel free to follow up with a service request. Thank you. At this time, there are no additional questions. Once again, if you'd like to ask a question, please press star one, unmute your phone, and record your name. We'll wait to see if any additional questions come in. Great, thanks, Andy. And, and while we're teeing up for the last uh, maybe couple of questions as we're coming up at uh, 345, I'll just take us back to the, the website and put a couple of placeholders in, if you haven't already, a uh, couple of upcoming webinars for, again, the FA and TA application and I'm going to defer to Clint and Amber if there's uh, you want to share anything on the rapid response program application uh, trainings that are upcoming but for the FA and TA we've got the next two calls uh, scheduled out in April again the application deadline is going to allow the uh, applicant to answer you know ask additional questions um, specific by program. So if you're applying for CDFI, uh, you can ask any questions related to the application with staff on April 7th. And then if it's related to the Native Initiatives program on April 8th. And so again, all of our webinars, regardless of whether it's for rapid response program or CDFI, uh, NACA, FA, or TA, 
it's always going to be the same phone conference line and bridge information. And so I'll defer to maybe Amber if you want to talk about the rapid response program. And while you do that, I'll just navigate over to the rapid response page. Amber? Yeah, great. Thank you so much. So um, we are, are very happy to announce that the CDFI rapid, rapid response program or the CDFI RRP has, uh, is announced um, today and we'll be awarding um, $1.25 billion to certified CDFIs that are certified as of the date of the NOFA publication, so tomorrow. Um, and we will be having a complete webinar with a presentation similar to this on March 3rd at 2 o'clock. And we will also have another one on March 10th at 2 o'clock as well. And you can see all of the information here. It's really important to note that you can apply for both CDFI and um, the RRP program, the CDFI and NACA programs, as well as the RRP programs. And you can also receive both awards um, in addition to applying for both. So you could be successful in receiving a $700,000 CDFI program award and a um, million dollar um, RRP award. They will have um, their own um, respective PG&Ms or program goals and measures, and there are some nuances, but I just want to make sure that everybody knows that all certified CDFIs meeting the eligibility criteria noted in the RRP NOFA um, will be eligible to um, apply for the RRP as well. But we aren't taking questions about RRP. Um, I just did want to put a plug in there um, for you guys to navigate over, read the, the um, the FAQs and look at the, the program overview, and we will have a lot more information um, coming out. And we have one last question. Linda Braunschweiger, what? you may go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, I have a question about how the staff looks at CDFIs who have received one round of funding in TA, but haven't yet submitted reports of progress. Um, is it best for us to wait to apply for FA until we can show that track record? It sounds like that might be an element of whether we move to another stage or not. Hi, this is Elizabeth. Uh, and I would say no, that that's not, um, that I wouldn't say that that, that is true. You should, uh, if you are a newly certified CDFI that has received TA in the past, or if you know, you're a small group that's received TA, uh, you know, I just really encourage you to consider what you are looking for the funds for. You know, financial assistance uh, is capital that you, can, that you can lend, and the TA is the more operational support. So for our SICA groups, uh, we do have, you know, groups who go back and forth between whether they apply for TA or FA in a given year based upon their needs. Um, but, you know, please come ahead and apply. The more the merrier. So the, the, the other... scoring of our evaluation of how we've deployed the money in the past, uh, if you don't have that track record, will we still move on? So this is Amber, um, and I want to just highlight that in um, the application materials, um, we have an evaluation process document and mm -hmm. it really does spell out exactly the questions um, and the process that we use. So I highly recommend that everybody on this call go to the base FA, FA evaluation, um, pro evaluation process document, which is on the screen now. There is, it's a five-step review process, and we have really increased the transparency at which um, we make sure that you know how we're reviewing things. And so, um, for example, we, we show you um, all of the ratios we use for the financial analysis um, and the um, historic rates of people passing through, which is more than 99%. Um, and then in step three, the business plan review, that's where the vast majority um, are separated. We show you the exact questions that we're asking the business plan reviewer. And so that's really important. I, I promise you it's literally verbatim. I copy and paste it from here into the... Um, into the, um, this document and into the guidance documents for the reviewers. 
So these are the questions that the external reviewers are, are using to answer um, your questions uh, and evaluate your application. And then further into step four, we also have the, the questions listed um, that the internal staff use to evaluate impact. And those are exactly the questions that the, te that the, the people the reviewing your application will use. Excellent. Thank you so much. You bet. Yeah, and we've gotten good feedback on this particular document, and I think a strategy some organizations will use just to get a second set of eyes before you submit your application is to have somebody within your organization sort of like put on their reviewer cap, if you will, and read your application and what you've prepared against this criteria and these questions, and just to double check that you've addressed these questions in the appropriate section. As Amber laid out, this is verbatim, you know, the charge that the external reviewers are using and the internal reviewers are using during steps three and four. And it's just helpful sometimes we know, you know, there's sort of organizations might be split up and, and you know, there's a grants and a development officer and then there's, you know, the lending team and then there's the finance team. This document is really arranged so that anyone within your organization who has an interest might just take a, a read through a particular application and use this to make sure that all the questions are addressed. And that's just, you know, some helpful feedback and uh, uh, in addition to what Amber added, just to complement how this document has been used successfully by other organizations. There are no additional questions. Great. It's been a busy day. Um, hats off to everyone for your interest and participation in the call, and especially to Matthew and Elizabeth and everyone on the CDFI Fund team. Um, again, um, we're excited to be bringing uh, these programs, multiple programs, uh, sort of at the same time uh, to the marketplace. And we're just encouraged that there's so much interest in both programs. Thank everyone for your participation today. And again, the best way to get a hold of us uh, to answer any questions is to submit a service request. And we're standing by, and we wish you all a great day and success in your application. Thanks, Sandy. That concludes today's conference. Thank you all for participating. You may now disconnect. Speakers, please stand by. <laughs>